I hear the word church, I think of God's family. I think of God's people. It, it goes beyond denominations. It goes beyond um, eras. Being in the military, I've, I've been in a lot of different churches all over the country um, and arguably all over the world. So um, it's, it's kind of the, the one thing that's always constant. Church is community. I know that's a big buzzword right now, but I think church is the place where where you can come and belong. Uh, it's, it's a place where you can know that people are always gonna be accepting of you, uh, no matter what you're going through right then, and they can also come alongside you and, and work with you as you're walking through your spiritual journey. Chris. Okay. What do you like about church? Um, my friends. Growing up in the church, I always um, associated it with a building, but um, I remember going to um, a summer camp uh, with one of my friend's churches. I don't know how to describe it, like you could just feel the Holy Spirit there, and it was awesome, and I was like, this is what it's about. <laughs> I think um, that I've come home, that I'm going to a house that is my family. I guess God's way uh, one of God's tools to help us to grow and it's something that I think God gets joy out of to have a church. Um, I think it probably brings some joy to see Christians get along and you know have relationships. So I got up this morning, <clears throat> got ready, put on my running shorts and shoes and my little belt with all the water bottles around it, my camelback, my goo packs, everything, because I was running the uh, Big Sur Marathon. Then my alarm went off and said, you're preaching today. <laughs> uh, whatever. <clears throat> That's a made up story, I made that up. So some stories are made up, but some stories are sort of true. Years ago, I was going abalone diving up north and a reporter from the Contra Costa Times called me. I lived in the Bay Area and said, I hear you're an abalone diver. They knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. And, they, and this woman said, I'm the adventure reporter. And I go out and do stuff. And I want to go do this with you. And I said, all right. So we met up at the beach at Fort Ross. And a photographer was there. And we went out. And it was a murky, overcast, foggy day, which is often is. And the Surface was a little choppy. Invisibility was really bad, about three feet. But for an abalone diver, it doesn't really matter because you go down and you wait till your, your eyes clear and the abalone don't go anywhere, so you pry them off anyway. So we're on the beach. She's putting on her wetsuit, already feeling a little, ah, I don't know. So we go out in the water and we're in about 10 feet of water. I mean, that's it. And we're not 20 yards from shore and she's going, okay, so now what? Now what? I said, well, we'll have to go down there because they're down there. She goes, okay, okay, I can do that, sure. I said, are you sure? Breathe easy, let's do it, breathe easy. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah I, can, I can do it. So she dipped her head in for about three seconds, popped it out and went, okay, I think I, think I get this. Have you ever see someone four wheel over the water? She, like a skitter bug, she headed back to the shore, climbed out on the sand, and I'm looking over there, and the photographer's with her, and she's grabbing her wetsuit going, get this thing off of me! So I think, well, this is going to be a fun story. So I finish getting the abalone, come out, the photographer stays, he takes some pictures. Then I read the story. About two or three weeks later, it's death-defying diving <laughs> under life-threatening conditions. And these men stare at the ocean and say, no, I will take what I want. It goes on and on. I'm going, man, I'm a death defier. <laughs> I don't, I, I tell life what to do. It was hilarious. Well, that was sort of true in that we were in the water and stuff happened. The story we're going to tell you this morning is all true. If you're reading books of the Bible, and Pastor Sean shared from it at the giving back time, this is a narrative. It's really cool because what it does is tell <clears throat> the stories in the books of the Bible the way they were originally written. Like if somebody wrote you a letter, you wouldn't want their letter broken up in chapters and verses. You'd want to hear the flow of the story. See, the Bible wasn't broken up into chapters until the 13th century. 
And it wasn't broken up into verses until the 16th century. And that was done so people could study it and reference places in the Bible. So we're telling great stories out of this book. If you don't have one, please make sure you get one. It's really cool. It's got a reading plan inside. Um, we'd love to have you join us in that. This morning, we're telling the story of the church, but not the history of the church up till now. Really, what I'm going to share is the story of the beginning of the church. Now, when you think of church, oftentimes we have a certain image that comes to mind, something like this. Many of you have been in churches like that, and they truly are beautiful and magnificent. And maybe when you think of church, you think, oh yeah, I've been to the cathedral at Notre Dame. I've been to this magnificent church. But that's, and those are great, but that's not what we're talking about. When we're talking about the church this morning, we're talking more about this. We are the church, you are the church, people are the church, and this is the story. If we told the story of the church up till now, it would be joyous and heartbreaking. The church has undergone tremendous persecution and suffering and brokenness to get to the point it is today, and sometimes the church did it to itself. So we don't have time to tell the story. It would take a year. So we're going to tell, talk about the birth of the church as we find it in the book of Acts. Now, I'm up here because this is God the Father and his plan from the passion in his heart to be reconciled with us. This is his plan. And at some point, I'll come down here to talk about Jesus, the Son. And down here, we're going to talk really about Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to help move the story of the church forward. So God the Father always had in his heart and in his passion and love for us to bring us back to himself. All people, all nations. We can read about it in Psalms. In Psalm 22, we read this. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over nations. When we use the Lord and see the Lord in this verse, it means God, Lord, God. At times, we'll think of or, or see it used as Lord Jesus. So just so you know, there is a difference, but both are Lord. The writer of Psalms 98 puts it another way. He says, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp and the sound of singing with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. In this plan of the Father, he needed to make a path back to us. And you can read sort of the beginning of the plan in Genesis 3 when he says the head of the serpent will be crushed under the heel of the woman. So sin had entered into the world by temptation from the serpent to Adam and Eve, and they had chosen sin. And sin became part of our DNA, part of what has us being broken people living in a broken world. And God said, I am without blemish, without sin. I can't be in fellowship with sin. I got to make a path back to me. And he set those things in motion. And what he did originally was this. He set apart for himself a people, the people of Israel. And in those people, he spoke into them with his plan. And that was, you can find it in halfway through the book of Exodus, through the book of Deuteronomy. He legislated things into the life of the people to help them learn how to live and do what he's asked them to do. So what do you, what do you read? There's laws given on how to live life day in and day out. There were offerings to the Lord, several kinds, and among them was the offering that, that would, it was hoped would take care of the sin problem. Within those offerings, as dictated into the people's life was go to the tabernacle and then the permanent tabernacle, the temple, and have animals sacrificed for your sin. And so we know throughout history, millions of animals were sacrificed. But here's the problem. Sacrificing an animal for your sin atoned for it means it covered the sin. 
And so that then you could come back into the temple, your sin was covered. It never wiped the sin out. It covered it. So what's in our nature? Sin. So people would sin again, so you have to go back to the temple. There was a cloud of smoke over the temple for centuries from burning the leftovers from sacrifices. They could never end. The other thing that happened over time in God's plan was not only did they have the original 600 plus laws given to Moses to give to the people, but the leaders of Israel over time expanded that and broke it down into details that created over 6,000 laws for daily life. How are you going to keep to 6,000 laws day in and day out in order to be right with your father, to be reconciled with God. It was impossible. It became a burden that the people couldn't bear, such that a thousand years before the time of Christ, prophecy began to say, there's an answer coming because this apparently is not the answer. It's not working. And the answer came in the center of the story. It came in the solution of Jesus. The solution came by the one and only Son. If you have uh, your uh, bulletins and you want to fill in words, this is the place to do it. The one and only Son whose sacrifice begins the birth of the Christian church. That's the birth of the Christian church. So Luke writes in the book of Acts, and he writes really two volumes. Did you know that in the book of Luke and in Acts, there's more written there than all of Paul's letters combined? In the book of Acts, Luke is capturing great detail about how did this church start? How did all this happen? And he tells this story, and he tells us a story that is so powerful, adventurous, and dramatic, and it's unpredictable, and it's thrilling and challenging and enlightening, and it's so much that a team of Hollywood scriptwriters could never have made this stuff up. It's, it's just true. And, and it's filled with miracles and divine intervention and death and illness and injustice, surviving hardship, grief and tears and joy and torture and surprises, letdowns and healings, resurrection from death, signs and wonders. And it took every bit of that to build a church that would endure, a church that would last. Because if you look at church history, that church has faced everything imaginable. Civilizations have attempted to crush it. Even now we fear that, oh, what's gonna happen to the church? I can tell you, don't fear, it's God's church. Man didn't invent it, and man can't wreck it. And that's how we got a church to today. It's a powerful, wonderful story. And something else you should know. In John, when Jesus says to, to Telestai, and he says, it is finished, he doesn't mean, I'm done working. I've done all the work. Sure, we know that he sat down at the right hand of God, but what, what's that about? That means sin is paid for. That work is done. He is not done working. He tells us in Matthew, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. But then what does he say? And surely I will be with you till the end of the age. He's just getting started in some ways. I mean, we're going. He's alive and well because Jesus did exactly what he said he came to earth to do. He filled it exactly. He began telling his followers early on, look, the Son of Man is going to have to pay the price. The Son of Man will be killed. The Son of Man will rise on the third day. This temple will be destroyed, but it will be rebuilt in three days. And what did that mean? It means in order to pay the price to wipe out sin, past, present, future, he had to live a sinless life, and he did. Fully man, fully God lived a sinless life. Then when it came time to pay the price, he willingly went. He was not dragged kicking and screaming to the cross. He knew what he came to do. He willingly went. And sometimes we can think that the price he paid was the, the flogging, that was awful. Sometimes it killed people. And crucifixion certainly killed people. And it was horribly painful. But that's not it. That was awful. But you know what was really awful? For a time, he was separate from the Father. That was the price and the only price that could pay for our sin, past, present, 
and future, and it's unimaginable to me. He was separate from the Father. He did it. And all we have to do is learn that, acknowledge it, and receive it. He made it that simple. Heartfelt, it's got to be here. You can't make it up. You can't fake it. But it's that simple. It's that simple. And then what? Then what happened? Well, Jesus began telling his, fo- telling his followers in um, John 13 and 14 and 15, just hours from the cross. He said, I know your word. I know you're scared. I know you don't fully understand. But when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. To do what? To push this movement forward. God's plan all along to push the movement forward. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to empower, guide, and support them and us in spreading the good news. And the Holy Spirit does just that. And how does he do it? I mean, with a kabam. You read in Acts 2, I can't even conceive of what it must have been like. They're gathered and they're convinced now and they know that he's risen and they get it. And they're just sort of waiting because he told them, wait, it's going to happen. And then it comes. We read in Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, like the sound of a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Can you imagine that? And the tongues of fire. And people heard their own languages spoken. Every kind of person from every country imaginable. And Peter gives this incredible speech and people end up saying, brothers, what do we do? Brothers, what shall we do? And he tells them. You know what he tells them to do is what we say when people ask us. So how do I, how do I become part of the body of Christ? How do I do it? We tell them what Peter did in Acts 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. See that price he paid belongs to anyone who says, I receive you, Jesus. I repent of my sins, mean turn away from, and I receive you. It's a beautiful thing. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And later you read that it says the people responded with awe and wonder. Awe. What is awe when we read that? Well, it's a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder, wonderstruck, amazed, overwhelmed in the good sense. Have you ever been struck with awe? You ever had that happen? If you'll indulge me, just just take a moment, let's close our eyes and just think about in your life when you experienced that feeling of awe, your senses were overwhelmed. And that fear and wonder and beyond what your brain can really contain, but there it was. Maybe it was in nature, maybe it was a sunrise or a sunset or something else extraordinary. It was awe and wonder. I've had it happen a few times in my life. Twice in Flagstaff, Arizona, I worked at the community hospital as a dishwasher while I was in college. And our daughter was about to be born. And two and a half years later, our son was about to be born. We had returned to the university to do graduate work. And in both cases, I'm up saying, pant blow, pant blow. You know the drill. Well, guys, some of you know the drill. <coughs> Women may know the drill. And the doctor says, it's hot shot from LA, he goes, You want to be up there doing that, or you just want to go ahead and deliver it? Excuse me? I said, sure, I haven't done that before, of course. And he let me come back and do it. I'm not saying he should have or shouldn't or whatever. It was a long time ago. (laughs) But maybe he did it for others, because two and a half years later, we were back there, and my son, it was his time, the doctor, same doctor, same nurse, he said the same thing. And he just said, hey, you want to do this one? I said, sure. The awe I experienced when they came out and held them. And then the awe of thinking, I'm a father. (laughs) What? Awe and wonder. 
These people are experiencing awe and wonder. And I look at my example of awe and wonder. This is what they had times a thousand. It's extraordinary work happening. And then they're moved to do things. When the Holy Spirit moves, they were moved to do things they'd never really done before or thought of to do before. Scripture tells us in Acts 2, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. When the Holy Spirit is moving, people are moved to like crazy, wild generosity. It's like, whatever, just take it. We just don't want anyone in need. Come on, bring it on. And we aspire to do that in church today, don't we? We aspire to live that same way. I'm a refugee of the troubled 60s. Those of you who were there know what I mean. We'll do the secret handshake after church. And <laughs> but you know what happened in the late 60s and early 70s was the Jesus, Jesus movement. And there was people who went out and made these communes to try to capture what we read in Acts. That's how powerful it was. And then so many came to believe it was crazy. It says in Scripture, many who heard the message believed. We read this in Acts 4. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. That's men, women, and children. That's a lot of people. And what caused this? What made it happen? Peter and the others are just preaching. They're just saying, you know, this is, we saw, we were with them. This is what we saw, and this is what happened, and it's all real, and it's all for all of us. And people are going, I want that. I want that. I want that. Oh, my goodness. Really? It's that simple? And so it's growing like crazy because when the Holy Spirit's moving in us, we just tell what he's doing in us. And people will get the authenticity of it and how genuine and real it is. And it says further in Acts 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And the Holy Spirit helps us do that. We just say, I'm just going to tell you my story. Here's what happened. Here's what he did in me, and here's what he's doing in me. I just want to share it with you. And then there was healing. As this church is building and these foundational things are put into place, there was tremendous healing. We read in Acts 5, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Can you imagine that being there? So-and-so who who's had this difficulty for years, and so-and-so who, who contracted this thing the other day, and so-and-so, and they're being healed. Oh, my gosh. It's powerful. The Lord heals today. He's sovereign. We don't tell him who to heal, but we know that he heals today. And then, as the church grew, they learned that they were going to have to be tough because through jealousy, the Jewish leaders arrested Peter and the gang. So the word says they were jealous. What are they jealous of? You're doing stuff, and people like you, and they're gathering around, and that really bugs us. It feels like a power shift. Go to, you're going to jail. That was it. Now, do you think Peter and all of his troops trembled? I don't think they did at all. I think they probably went, are you kidding? You're going to put me in jail? Like, what's that going to do? Do you understand what's happening here? The Holy Spirit is here, and it's moving, and it's building something. You're going to put me in jail? You built a jail. The Lord is building the church. Then they learned that they needed to organize because you get all these thousands of people coming. And you had people with great needs. The word tells us that you had Greek groups over here and other groups here and Hebrews over here and they all had widows and orphans and how are you going to make the decision whose needs to meet? And Peter finally goes, oh, man, we're getting bogged down in all this, like distribution networks and everything. And he was inspired by the Spirit to pray. And we read in the Word, it says, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them. And we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And they do that. There's a list of those people. Two of those people were Stephen and Philip who we learn in Acts went on to do powerful things in ministry that were notable and they're written about. But Stephen finds himself in a very unique position because he's being persecuted and cornered as he preaches about Jesus, gives a wonderful uh, a speech or a wonderful like teaching in the book of Acts. And he's accused of blasphemy and he says that I see the Lord seated at the right hand of the Father, which is blasphemy to a practicing Jewish leader. 
So the people pick up stones to kill him. Now, they didn't have any right to kill anybody under Roman rule, so it was a mob action. A mob action just rose up, kill him, kill him, kill him, and his followers scatter. The apostles didn't go anywhere, but the followers scatter. And, it, and we read this, on, a, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. As Stephen died, and he prayed for them, the ones killing him, something amazing happened. Not the apostles, but the other followers scattered out into places that generally nobody went. And they took the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Almost like the first evangelical mission trip. And while this is happening, there's a guy over here named Saul. And he's holding the robes of some of those who are throwing the rocks. And he's doing it with great satisfaction. He was passionate and brilliant and committed zealously committed to the cause of doing what he believed was right, persecuting Christians. And he's going, this is great, all right, good stuff. A rising star in the world of Jewish leadership. Jesus had other plans. Jesus had other plans. Jesus addresses Paul. Saul becomes Paul later. He addresses Saul on the road to Damascus where he has orders in his possession that he's taking to Damascus to tell people there that I have the right to persecute Christians here and he is happy about the trip. This is going to be a great trip. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's not going to happen like that. We read here, as he neared Damascus on his journey in Acts 9, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul is commissioned. His whole life changes in a heartbeat. His brilliance didn't go away. His passion and zealousness did not go away. His giftedness did not go away. He shifted who he was serving. And he was going to use all that for Jesus. And so we learn as his story unfolds that his commission was to establish churches all around the known world as far as he could go. That wasn't Peter's. It was Paul. And, he, and churches pop all, all over the place. They just come out everywhere. And when the Holy Spirit's on the move, that's what happens. And Paul then establishes leaders in those churches, some he spends a lot of time with, some a short period of time. Then he goes back around to nourish and visit them, and he writes letters to them. And then he gives them guidelines on how to live and how to be as a church because they're already having struggles. That's the world we live in, folks. They're already having struggles. And then God, in his great plan as it unfolds, this verse comes out, and Peter says this. And I love this. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And Paul is directed to the Gentiles. And here's what this means. Gentiles, everybody's not a Jew. Jesus had already eaten at Matthew's table. God in his original plan had already said all nations. Paul now carries it further. He'll put a church anywhere God tells him to. He doesn't care about the ethnic background. He doesn't care if the culture is different. None of that matters. It doesn't matter at all. It's the hearts of anybody, anywhere. And that's us today. And if it isn't, it should be. But I believe it is. In all churches that call Jesus Lord and Savior. And he tells Paul, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Then he gives the leaders of the church guidance. Guidance that we listen to today. In Acts 20, in 20, he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. When I thought about becoming a pastor, I had no idea I was gonna be a pastor. They asked me to be one. I didn't even know I could do it. I had no idea. 
And I remember it took me weeks of prayer, and I would cry, and I'd cry out to the Lord. I said, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And the answer came and said, I want you to do it. And that answer is from the Holy Spirit. I couldn't in my heart in any way go try to be a pastor. I would have never done that. I don't think it works like that. It's the Holy Spirit moving us and telling us, this is what I want for you and want from you. And then Paul says something in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It's become a verse that I've memorized by accident. I've read it so many times because I need it so much. This is personal for each one of us. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. That doesn't make any sense. That's counterintuitive. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't feel like rejoicing today. What's going on in my life is nothing to rejoice about. Maybe I got it wrong. Give thanks in all circumstances. Are you kidding me? We just lost a job. We got an illness. We got medical bills to pay. How am I going to give thanks in those circumstances? I think you give thanks when kind of good and cool stuff is happening. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Pray continually. Well, I pray when I get up and we pray at meals and we pray when we want stuff. I mean, I, I fall into that. He says continually what? I want to walk with you. I want fellowship with you. I want relationship with you. Rejoice always. I'm not able to do it. And he goes, good. The Holy Spirit will help you do it. You aren't able. It's supernatural. And give thanks in all circumstances. Why would he even suggest that? Because what do we do if we don't? Think about the other side of that. If we don't give thanks in all circumstances, then the circumstances come to define me and my life. It's dark, it's broken, it's hopeless, it can't work. And after a while, I'm in danger of sinking into despair. And I give thanks, and Lord, I don't understand why stuff's happening. I still have losses in my life. Loss of my brother, loss of loved ones. They don't make any sense to me to this day, and I thank him. Why? I'm not saying he caused it. I'm not saying he did it to, to do something else in me. I don't know what he did, but I know I can find him in it. He's in everything. And if I look for him, I can find him. And so I'm gonna rejoice in that, on faith that the Holy Spirit gives me. And then darkness has no hold on me. Despair can't even come on the scene. And I can still have joy and I can still have hope and I can have energy and I can focus on the day. And brokenness can be repaired. The church should be a place where despair is brushed away and hearts are healed and brokenness is repaired. And we do that when we follow Paul's advice. When the Holy Spirit's on the move, it's a new day every day. We wake up in his grace and his mercies and his power are ours as part of our life for that day, every day, every day. So, so what did that church have that we have in the church still today? Because our thread right now, this moment goes all the way back to that, all the way back. God is sovereign, he's above all. He chose the time and the place and the how and the who to present his plan. We learned that he chose all kinds of people to use in his word, didn't he? Every kind of person imaginable. And that's exactly what he does today. That's why we do gifts assessment. That's why we teach organic outreach. He wants to use anybody and everybody. Nobody's outside of that. Building and growing <clears throat> the church will bring persecution and suffering. And I pray with new believers at times and three months later say, I don't know what's going on because the hard times are still here. And I say, no, 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 no. It doesn't mean that there are no more hard times. It means now you have strength and someone with you through them. That's what it means. And the word of God is written in our Bible. We can feast on it, teach it, read it, immerse ourselves in it every day, anytime we choose. We also know that then is now. Reconciliation with the Father is available through Jesus. His arms are open wide. Nobody's outside that plan. Nobody. He wants everyone. His arms are open wide. And then we know that then is now the church and 
our church, this group of people here right now, it's a place of worship, of healing, of compassion and care of the one another's. It's an oasis in a harsh world, isn't it? It's an oasis and it should be. It should be. We need community. We need fellowship. And we need a base camp to operate out of. We come here for refuge. We come here for healing. We, we, we're in the body uh, because we need the one another with, with each other. And then we don't keep it to ourselves because we think as we should. He's given me everything. How in the world would I just say, I'm happy? That's all I'm going to do. We would never do that. We're going to follow Jesus. We're sending it out. The church is a base camp as well. It's a place of comfort and care and safety and healing and compassion and a place where we can be equipped and go out and do what he's called us to do. Jesus said, teach him to obey all that I've commanded you. And Jesus said, they'll know you're Christians by your love for one another. The commission was real then, it's real right now. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this. Thank you that we have a church. Lord, how great is that? And it wasn't just a moment in history. <clears throat> it was a beginning. And here we are in it today. It still faces persecution, has challenges, unexpected difficulties, and great surprises and great joy and great community. We're so blessed. Help us not take church for granted and just write it off and say, ah, it's a regular Sunday or a regular midweek or anything. Help us take full advantage of the body of Christ as our refuge, our oasis, and our base camp. Thank you, Father, for all that you've given us and you've done it by love. We pray these things. We thank you for what we'll continue to do as the church and trust you for the outcome. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus and all together said, amen. amen.